Hopefully we can touch upon the connection between two very different ways that we as human beings know anything. The way we encounter truth is both through our reason, our human reason, and it is also through our faith. God gives us two really beautiful ways to know the world that we live in and to encounter his creation. And so I sort of begin with kind of an exploration of that, okay? So, for those of you that don't know what it is, we're talking about a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth, and it's not just any linen, okay? It's a very fine linen. We're gonna talk about the weave, we're gonna talk about what we know about the textile itself, but it's a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth that is of interest to us because it bears the image of a man who has been scourged and crucified in Roman fashion. And when I say that, what I mean is you can look at the image and see, even with the naked eye, you can see that this is someone who has been crucified. And this man has been badly beaten. But the point I want to make here to you is that this is a forensically accurate image. In other words, this is not a painting, this is not an artwork, this is not a photograph. This was a real human form, and I'll tell you how we know that as we go along. Science actually can demonstrate why we know this was a real man who was wrapped in this linen. It's forensically accurate, anatomically perfect. Five foot, 10 inch man that weighed about 160 to 170 pounds who was scourged and crucified and capped with something very thorny on his head, and he was pierced in the right side, right between his fifth and sixth ribs. It's all demonstrated forensically in the linen itself. So here's the reason that this is of such interest to us, of course, is because who else in history could that be? It's not like we would look at this and say, oh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> but it has been subjected to more study more academic examination than any other artifact that exists in the world. And I'm gonna let that rest for a minute because you need to feel the gravity of that. There have been more hours of academic study brought to bear on this 14 and a half foot strip of linen than any other object that we have in the world today. Okay, from every discipline, name one. Because it's not just my discipline of history that's interested in it. It's not just theology that's interested in it. This, this textile has been examined by physicists, chemists, botanists, biologists, hematologists, forensic medical experts, imaging specialists. Name one, name a discipline that's been brought to bear on this cloth, and this is the great challenge we have. The more we study objects of the material world, if I had told you that there had been a million hours of study brought to bear on something, and it was a man-made material object, how long would it take all of our great science to figure it out? Objects of the material world always give up their secrets, always give up their answers. The more we study this linen, the philosophical challenge we have is, the more we study it, the less we know it. The more we study and the more questions we answer, the more questions we have. Science can swoop in and do a test and answer a question and it opens up five new questions. So we've reached sort of a, um, a philosophical limit, if you will. I think this is the best way to say it. We are really confronting the limits of our human capacity when we confront and counter this linen. And maybe that has some meaning. We are confronting the limits of what we are able to know. Okay, so let's do a little dive. There it is. There's a beautiful, I understand this is, um, Jameson, you said this was your sister that did this? Mm -hmm. This frontal image right here, this is very beautiful. Um, there's actually a dorsal side as well. You can see this behind me. Um, and actually this image needs to be flipped. Do this in your mind and just flip that image so that the head, the head, the face is on the other side because it's actually flipped. But imagine you have a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth and you have a, the frontal side, uh, in other words, the, the front of the man's body on one side and the back of the man's body on another. We've already got an interesting challenge of understanding how that image would have happened. And I think you'll see this as we go along, how we know that the orientation of the body that was in this linen and what it means. But if you go to Turin, Italy today and you see the real thing, um, which they only put on public display now every 10 years, 
But if you saw it, this is what you would see with the naked eye. This is all the medieval Christian pilgrim would have ever seen. It's just the faint image of a man who's obviously, bear, he bears a, 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 a wound in his wrist, a large bloody wound at his feet. But the medieval pilgrim didn't know what you and I know, or what you and I will know after I show it to you if you don't know it already. They would have never seen what the age of science and the age of photography and imaging has revealed for us. And yet they believed because someone in authority had told them this was the burial linen of Christ. Now, I don't want to, um, I'm not going to bore you with the history lecture, but you had to know when you invited the history professor that you're going to get a little bit of that, right? <laughs> So in 1532, excuse me, um, 1355, the, the shroud went on display for the first time. It shows up in the documented historical record for the first time in the middle of the 14th century. That does not mean that the shroud did not exist before 1355. I'll be very clear about that. Speaking historically, I can tell you that there is a chain of custody I could put together that goes all the way back to the first century. The problem is that, that we, we have a consensus that has to be reached about what the record means. So 1355, we have the cloth that turns up in Lyre, France. It's in the possession of a knight named Geoffrey de Charny. He built a chapel in Lyre. He put it on public display and said, this is the burial linen of Christ. And of course, nobody questioned it. People came by the hundreds and then the thousands to come and see this, this cloth. It remained in the Descharny family until 1453, when it passed into the ownership of a house, uh, the House of Savoy. If you know anything a little bit about European history, that name might mean something to you. The House of Savoy is the same royal house that produces the kings of Italy. The last of the Savoy family died in 1983. He was King Umberto II of the type of the titular king of Italy. So the cloth remained in the family of the Savoy until 1983. And a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people, how many of you came here today thinking that this is something that's owned by the Roman Catholic Church? No. It was owned by the Savoy family, a private family, until 1983. And when Umberto II died, he willed it to an individual. He didn't will it to the institution of the church. He willed it to the living pope as an individual. At that point in time, it was Pope St. John Paul II. So the owner of the cloth today is Pope Francis as an individual. The church does not own it. So it will just pass into the hands of each successive bishop of Rome as an individual. But that happened in 1453. So the Savoy family owned it for a very, very, very long time. Uh, much of its history, actually, documented is in the hands of the Savoy. Something very interesting happened in 1532. The Savoy family had built a chapel on the grounds of their private chateau uh, in Chambéry, France, which is right over uh, the border in France. They built a, um, a beautiful chapel to house this shroud, and there was a fire there in 1532. So if you look at the shroud today, one of the things you notice is, of course, there's a parallel set of scorch marks that run the length of the linen. Do you see those? Parallel to each other, scorch marks, that run the entire length of the linen. That's from that 1532 fire. Now, y'all get ready because I'm getting ready to give you a test question that I'm going to ask everybody at the end. Are y'all ready? See, this is how I make sure my students pass as <laughs> I stop and say, okay, are you ready? Because this is the test question. So in 1532, when this fire happened, uh, there was a group of Franciscans who were taking care of the cloth. They ran in and rescued it. But it had been in a metal reliquary, folded up in such a way that when the metal heated up from the fire, it left these scorch marks. Interestingly, not harming the linen at all. Uh, the shroud has actually been in two fires. It was in another fire in the late 20th century and <laughs> deliberately set fire that time. Uh, and again, not damaged. Didn't even have smoke damage to it. So <clears throat> that happened in 1532. Now here's the test question. In 1534, the sister order to the Franciscans, the poor Clares, took the shroud into, a, into their convent there in Chambéry, and they wanted to repair it, to strengthen it, 
to the apparently very loving care of it because of what they believe that it was so they sewed on a strip of linen to the back of it it's called the holland backing cloth sewed on new linen they put linen patches into it which are the triangular shapes that you see when you look at the at the image with the naked eye you see these triangles they were sewn in as patches and then here's something we learned in the 20th century they apparently introduced cotton fibers to the old linen. Cotton and, the cotton and linen, everybody knows this, because we all are in the South, right? You know that cotton and linen are not the same thing. Linen, this linen comes from flax. Cotton grows as, as cotton, right? Two different things. Well, they introduced cotton, and the reason we found that out in the 20th century is because we developed something called the ability to image things under ultraviolet light. And under ultraviolet light, one of the things that was noticed about the shroud is that the entire thing, the entire cloth is the same color. It's this homogenous, beige, sepia-toned color that you see with the naked eye, except for the top left corner. The top left corner of this linen fluoresces a bright green, and I'm looking at that tablecloth right there, green. So, Chemists knew, chemists who were on this uh, Shroud of Turin research project knew there was something chemically different about that part of the linen. That it couldn't be the same makeup as the rest of the cloth. So there was a chemist by the name of Ray Rogers, and I'll talk about him just a little bit later too. Uh, a chemist named Ray Rogers, who was actually at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, he was no slouch, and he argued that something had happened in that corner and that probably it was a result of that 16th century repair that was done to the linen. The top left corner. So y'all plant that in your mind, the top left corner of this linen. Y'all got that? You'll see why, you'll see why. Okay, that's that, um, the, 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 the modest little chapel in Chambary, uh, which the, the uh, Savoy family owned. That is the little niche in the wall behind the high altar where they stored their uh, relic of the shroud and actually if you go there today and I've had the great privilege of being here in this small chapel if you sit there you can look up and you can still see the scorch marks in the stone from the fire that was there it's pretty remarkable okay so the next thing that happens is it moves to Turin Italy in 1578 and it will always be there it's never going to leave that was part of the deal the Savoy family made when it was willed to the living Pope otherwise you know the Pope would have that in the Vatican and it would never be seen right I mean, it would hide it away into one of those secret archives somewhere. But, but the deal was that it had to remain in Turin, Italy, and could never leave. And so that's why it is there today. The next time it's on public display, by the way, before I forget to tell you, will be, will be um, 2025. Um, you can look for news about that if you want to think about going. That would be when to go. The, um, the next thing that happens in its history, let's fast forward a long time. Let's go to the year 1898 that the Shroud is photographed for the very first time. Now remember that, I'm looking around the room, I'm thinking, how many of us know, understand negative photography? Do you remember taking your film and getting it developed and you'd get the negatives back? You should see me trying to explain this to young people. <laughs> I'm like, okay, take out your iPhone, turn on the settings for invert, and try to explain to them what a photographic negative is. But uh, many of us will remember or will, will understand this terminology. So in 1898, there was an amateur photographer named Secunda Pia, um, who went to the Savoy family and asked if he could photograph the shroud. Now that is his very sophisticated equipment. He was an amateur, but, but this was state-of-the-art photography in the late 19th century because this required him to take about a 12 by 12 inch glass plate and take a prolonged explode exposure on this glass plate and then take that glass, it's about a quarter of an inch thick, into his dark room to process it using photographic chemicals, right? We're kind of ringing a bell with some of us. We kind of, not that you remember 1898 photography, but that you remember something about negative photography. So he was really the first one in the world to ever see what nobody really knew before um, when he processed that, that photographic plate. And you're looking there on the right, that's his image that's um, his photographic positive that is in the possession of the Archdiocese of Turin now. Uh, that's his photograph. 
But when he went to process in the dark room his photographic plates, he was the first one in the world to ever see this. And as a matter of fact, he was accused of having created a hoax. He was accused of that. It was 33 years before the, before the Savoy family allowed this cloth to be photographed a second time. 33 years. And in 1931, when it was photographed by a professional photographer, Giuseppe Henriette, he got the exact same result. And every single photographer ever since has gotten the exact same result. So Secunda Pia was eventually vindicated. But what he realized, of course, is that what you see with the naked eye is not the real image. It's a mirror image. And in fact, when you're looking at the cloth itself, you're looking at the photographic negative. When you look at the negative, now you are looking at the positive image of the man. That is his left wrist that is pierced. So, that goes back to, um, to one of the characteristics of this cloth that sets it apart from any other object in the world. Is the, this is the way it photographs. Nothing else photographs this way. And I don't mean the image. I'm talking about the photographic properties. The reason that um, that Secunda Pia was accused of creating a hoax is because what he did was he flipped the images. The negative is the positive, and the positive is the negative. If you look at it with the naked eye, you were looking at a photographic negative. So he was accused of having created some kind of hoax because it violates the way photography works. It's the inverse of the way photography works. The second thing that happened that sets it apart from anything else that we've ever studied is in 1976, NASA and a company called Jet Propulsion Laboratories were working with the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs to come up with technology that would take photographs from outer space and read them for dimension. So in other words, you could take a photograph of the moon. If you look at a photograph, it's a flat one-dimensional image, right? Do you take that and you would run it through something called the VPA analyzer that they developed? It's called eight because it's the eighth version they got to before they got, got what they wanted. Um, the VPA analyzer would take these photographs and read them for dimension. You could tell, for instance, if, um, if, if this photograph of the moon, like how high was that mountain on the moon? Was that really a crater on the moon? If so, you know, just could have show the dimension of that. And Dr. John Jackson, who's a nuclear physicist, um, still living, has retired, long since retired from the Air Force Academy now, but um, Dr. John Jackson was uh, interested in the shroud, had been for a long time, and he, they started running all sorts of photographs through this analyzer just for comparative data to see what would happen. For instance, if you took a photograph of the Mona Lisa, this is one of the things they did, took a photograph of the Mona Lisa and ran it through this analyzer, you've got a very distorted flat image because there's no dimensionality to the Mona Lisa. It's a painting. If you took a photograph of anything and ran it through this, you would get a one-dimensional image because that's what a, a photograph is. It's just, it's, if there's no dimension to it, there's no dimension to it. So Dr. John Jackson said, I want to run a photograph of the shroud through this analyzer because he already knew that it had unusual photographic properties. So he was kind of on a quest to see what else he could learn about the, what the eye sees. That was 1976. And that's the result when they ran the photograph of the shroud through this VPA analyzer. When Dr. Jackson saw this result, and of course realized immediately the implications of it, which is that this cloth had actually covered a real human person when the image was formed. Do you understand that dimensionality means it is not an artwork? This is not a painting. Nobody painted this image. This was really wrapping a human form. When he realized this, he saw the result, he looked at everybody in the room and he said, we're taking a team of scientists to Turin. And he put together a group of over 30 from lots of different specialties all over the world, including a Jewish photographer, and they went to Turin, Italy, and they had five days of unrestricted access to perform every test they could without touching upon the image, of course. They were very strict about that. But they could perform every test that they could. They filed a protocol ahead of time, 
had five days and they worked 24 hours around the clock to get in all that they wanted to do to study this linen. Because these are the two things that set it apart. Nothing else photographs this way. The eye sees the photographic negative, not the positive. And it actually has dimensional information encoded in the very top fibrils of this linen. Now, I don't want to blow your mind too much, but I want to, I want to explain to you what I, what I mean when I say fibril. So do you understand, everybody kind of image in your mind what a thread looks like? What a thread looks like, okay? Now, take that thread apart, and each thread has about 100 fibers in it. And each fiber has about 100 fibrils. This image, in all of its complexity, is only on the very top fibrils of this linen. All this dimensional information, all of this information about the man's wounds is in the very top fibrils of this linen. Now, what does that mean? You could scrape it off with a razor blade. That's how superficial it is. Yet, it contains all of this incredible information, detail about the man himself who was wrapped in this cloth. Okay, so... I mentioned um, this is the only scientific examination of the shroud that was ever permitted. That was in 1978. There were samples taken in 1988 for carbon-14 dating, which I'll talk about separately. But the shroud has not been examined since, except using samples that were taken in 1978. Uh, for reasons that we'll talk about if we have time, the, the owners, uh, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis, um, have been reluctant. Uh, Pope Francis is reluctant right now to allow further scientific testing, and we can talk about why that is. It's not because the church is afraid of science. It's because, as Pope Francis said, that there is not enough science to convince someone who is determined to believe that this man is not Jesus. And there is not enough science that would ever convict, convince someone that it's anyone other than Jesus who believes that it is. And the fact that Christians don't need a relic to demonstrate the resurrection. Okay? But what's fascinating about that, and the position of the church has been since, the, since uh, Pope John Paul II owned it, is that we also must embrace science as a way of knowing God's creation. So, don't look for anything anytime soon, I don't think. But this, this one time it was examined in 1978... Uh, that's Dr. Jackson, by the way, Dr. John Jackson, who has become a friend of mine. He's, as I said, he's a nuclear physicist who, oh my gosh, I can talk, I can hang with for about five minutes. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? And then it's like, I don't know, okay, you need to talk to me like I'm a sixth grader. Okay, make that a third grader. Because he's just one of the most brilliant minds I've ever met. And I worked with NASA for many, many, many years and the Air Force Academy. And he works on the shroud every single day of his life. And he's now... Uh, over 80 years old, and he's never, never had a day in his life where he's not done some work on this project. That's him um, getting his first look there underneath the, uh, the backing cloth I told you about that was there, and him looking through the very primitive telescope now to us, right? Okay, so I know you can't probably read all that, and that's okay if you can't. This is really more to remind me not to forget anything. When all of that information began to be published in the early 1980s from this scientific research, this was the findings, the summary findings of those 30 plus scientists who went to Turin in 1978. It is actually a, a, a real man was wrapped in this cloth. We know that from the dimensionality of the image itself. It covered a real human form. And it was a man who was scourged and crucified in Roman fashion. Um, he was capped with something very thorny on the top of his head. As you can see that. One wrist is pierced, the left one, we can't see the other one. Uh, both feet are pierced with something um, that, that bled profusely. This man has over 360 individual wounds on the body that cover the entire body. From, his, from the neck, the back of the neck, all the way down the back of the body to really to the ankles, and then up the front of the body including the midsection, not so much on the chest area, but certainly the shoulders and arms. Uh, these have been examined, these wounds have been examined under the, the intense magnification that we're able to bring to bear today with our microscope technology. These have been examined by forensic uh, medical experts 
who say that the, all of, every single wound on the body was caused by the exact same weapon. We know the exact outline of each individual wound. They are all exactly the same. It's the same weapon that, that, that he was beaten with. But here's something very interesting we know forensically. How many of you have ever watched CSI? CSI, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like this, think of this as CSI Jerusalem. <laughs> CSI Jerusalem. CSI. So CSI, forensic science, tells us that this man was beaten with a very specific type of weapon. It was a weapon that has three, three cords to it, and on the end of each cord there were two metal balls separated by about an inch or an inch and a half, and these metal balls are all exactly the same. They're a little bit asymmetrical, okay? When you look at them under magnification, you can see it's the same wound throughout, uh, across the body. This man was beaten not by one man, but by two. There was one on either side of him, and one of them was taller than the other. And we know that from the directionality of the wounds. So now I'm entering a, a sort of an area now where uh, everything I'm telling you would be admitted forensically in a court of law. If you had a CSI case and you wanted to present evidence, every single thing I'm going to tell you would be admissible in a court of law about the wounds the man suffered, the type of weapon that caused it, all about the blood spatter, tells us a lot about the blood spatter, uh, the, the blood flow, both pre-mortem and post-mortem, tells us a lot about the position of the body. There's so much here, but I want to assure you that I am not telling you anything that there's not a scientific consensus on. As a matter of fact, I try to stay away from that, which is there's not a consensus on. But this man was beaten with something that aligns perfectly with the first century Roman flagrum. And now how do we know that? Because we have some that have survived, that are in museums. We know what the Romans used as an instrument, of, as a whip, a flagrum is, is what it was called. The wound that is between the fifth and sixth ribs, there is, you can actually see it even in the photographic negative positive form. You can see that there's a separation of blood and clear fluid at that wound. Under extreme magnification, we again can see the width and depth and breadth of the wound, that, of the weapon that caused that wound. I can tell you the exact width of the blade, how long it was from the base of the blade to the point of the blade. And forensic scientists will tell you they know the weapon that caused it, and it's a first century Roman lance. Okay? All of this came out of the 1978 research project. There's traces of aloe and myrrh on the cloth, particularly around the head. We know that those are, are commonly used in burial rituals. Uh, especially for, for Jews. Uh, aloe and myrrh, traces of both there. No paints or dyes of any kind on the cloth to account for the image itself. Lots of pollens. This is fascinating because they took lots of pollens from the linen in night, beginning actually in 1973. There was a, a, a Swiss botanist by the name of Max Fry who got access to the linen. They took a few samples. And then in 1978, they took a lot more. This actually makes me shudder to tell this story every single time, but in 1978, they vacuumed the cloth. Let's pause. <laughs> yes, they vacuumed it because one of the things that they noticed were heavy concentrations of soil, what appeared to be soil, particularly along the bridge of the nose area, extending into the hairline on each side, the eye sockets, basically, um, the knee area, and obviously the feet, large concentrations of soil. So that the, the cloth was vacuumed in 1978. They took that soil and put it in a, like I remember those old fold-over Ziploc bags? Do you remember those? And labeled it dirt. How scientific is that? <laughs> dirt. Well, let's talk about why. In 1978, we didn't yet know, we didn't yet know that soils have specific signatures at extreme magnification, have specific kind of crystalline structures that can place it in a certain geographic area. For instance, do we have red clay in North Louisiana? Amen. Is there red clay in Georgia? Are they the same? No, they look nothing alike. They look nothing alike, microscopically look nothing alike. 
So this is gonna be important because even though they didn't know in 1978 where the soil came from, they took it, they felt it would be like important evidence. They put it away in a, in a vault and lo and behold, about 20 years ago, we were able to test that and take representative samples from around a certain area and were able to identify the, the precise signature of this particular soil. So that's gonna be important too, as you will see. This is the position of the body at the time the image was formed. Now, how do we know this? Because that information that came from the VP8 analyzer, do y'all remember that? That dimensional information? Think of it as being spatial. So there is a direct correlation between the places that the cloth touched the body and the places where it didn't. The places where the cloth touched the body directly, there's much more of an image imprint. The places where it didn't touch the body, you can tell the spatial relationship, right? Is that kind of making sense? Think of it like an animation for a movie. If you were gonna write a computer code to animate a character for a Disney movie, you would have to write this kind of dimensional information into a computer code. Well, they didn't have to write this. It's already there, and it's just extracted from the cloth itself. Um, there's, this has been attested to by so many different laboratories that have worked with this linen. This is the position of the body. You can tell from the flexion of the neck and the knees, um, the flexion of the feet, that forensic experts have said that this man was in a state of rigor mortis when the image was formed because of the position of the body itself. Rigor mortis sets in a few hours after death and it resolves within at least 72 hours. So we're talking about a three day window within which this image was formed on the clock. The man had not been dead more than three days when the image was formed. The textile itself has been subjected to a lot of different analysis, and I always say this uh, just because I think it's interesting. As someone who has studied a good bit about the Middle Ages, and I don't know a lot about the process of looming in the Middle Ages, but I will tell you this, it didn't change much over a thousand years. In the ancient world, if you were gonna make a piece of cloth, you did it a certain way, and in the medieval world, they're still doing it that way. A thousand years, two thousand years, really. We, we could go to today. If you wanted to hand loom something, the most common way you would create a cloth is you would hang a vertical thread, and you would run a thread over and under, over and under, over and under, horizontally. Does that make sense? Very simple, one over one weave. It's very easy to produce. Uh, that you could mass produce these, cut them, sell them, and, uh, very, very common way to do things. This is not that. <laughs> this is a very unusual and expensive linen. It is a three over one herringbone weave. And actually, when I saw it uh, for myself, and as, as uh, Jameson mentioned, I got to spend some time with the cloth, um, really about an hour with it in July. And, and not even under any sort of imaging or, or microscopic examination, you can see this with the naked eye, but the herringbone weave is beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of linen. It's a beautiful piece of linen. But it was an expensive cloth. So whoever this man was, who was beaten and crucified and capped with thorns and pierced in the right side and wrapped in a linen, he got a very nice shroud. He had an expensive shroud. So whoever bought this, whoever owned this, was someone of means. This was someone who had money. Okay, the blood evidence, the blood on the shroud is human. It is type AB, it is male. We uh, actually can't even add to the list. I couldn't, I couldn't give you a slide that has all the laboratories that have verified this. The type AB, it is male, that's really all we know about it. We do not know anything about the, the, the genome, as a matter of fact, there's an incomplete helix. We don't, we, we're not able to give any genetic information about this person. But it is type AB and it is male. And this is interesting because it makes it a forensic match for another relic that I used to be a little hesitant to mention and now I'm not. It makes it an, it makes it an interesting comparison. Um, how many of you in here, say we have about 100 people, how many of you have type AB blood? Anybody? 
Well, statistically, it's about 3% of the population. So I would think in, in 100 people, we have a, a couple or three. Nobody. Maybe you don't know your blood type. We have one. We have one over here, one over here. Is that it? Two? Statistically, that's about right. Okay. If it were type AB negative, it would be 1% of the population, but we don't have the RH factor. So what I'm pointing out to you is that it's an exceedingly rare blood type. So the fact that it's a forensic match for another relic that I want to mention to you real quickly makes it all the more compelling now that we know the blood type. There is a cloth that is held in Oviedo, Spain, uh, not, an, not an expensive linen, a rather cheap one, as a matter of fact, very simple weave. Uh, but it arrived in Oviedo, Spain in the year 613, and all of this is documented very well in the historical record. It arrived out of Jerusalem, it was brought from Jerusalem in the year 613, and it was brought in a, an ancient relic or an ancient box. And the tradition behind it, when they received it in this little religious community in Oviedo, is recorded in their record that this came from Jerusalem and it was purported to have belonged to the Apostle James. Now for many centuries, I think a lot of people didn't pay too much attention to this linen. But when the information began to be published about the shroud, there began to be more and more interest because when this cloth was tested, it is human blood, it is type AB, and it is, um, contains many of the same pollens that I'm going to talk about. And then when forensic science developed in the 20th century, they were able to, to really study the blood flow, blood spatter pattern on this linen. They realized that this cloth had covered the face of the same man who was wrapped in the shroud. There's over 120 points of congruity for blood spatter between this cloth and the shroud. There's a stain on the back of this that's an exact match. You can line them up microscopically. They line up perfectly. So what is this linen? Go read John's chapter 20, because John is the only of the evangelists who gives us this detail. Remember the scene? Peter and John ran to the tomb. Remember the scene? John tells us that he waits, he hangs outside, and Peter runs into the tomb. And then he says, does the other disciple, talking about himself, the other disciple looked into the tomb and saw the burial linen lying there, including, and John's the only one who says this, including the cloth that had covered Jesus' head that was rolled up in a separate place by itself. Sometimes this is called the napkin. The Greek word that John uses is sudarium, which is a sweat cloth, uh, commonly used by people, men of, of that time who wrapped their heads, they were working outside, uh, or carried it somehow to wipe the sweat from their body. There's no question that Jesus' head would have been covered when he came down from the cross because it was Jewish sensibility. He had died a brutal death. He would, they would, his face would have been immediately covered. The reason that this is so interesting is John tells us there was such a cloth. And because it had blood on it, it had to be buried with the body. Under Jewish law, that's part of the body. Blood is the body. So it was placed in the tomb, but Jesus was not wrapped in this. It would have been removed before he was enshrouded. The fact that it is the same blood type and it is a forensic match and the fact that we know where this cloth has been since the year 613 means, obviously, if you're tracking me, that these cloths had to cover the same man before the year what? 613. 613. Okay, so hold that thought too. There's 70, excuse me, 56 different pollens on this uh, cloth. Seven of them are unique to the Middle East. There's only one place in the world where three of them are found together, and that's in and around the old city of Jerusalem. At some point in its history, this cloth was in the city of Jerusalem. If I commit a crime in Stonewall, Louisiana today, I'm not, but if I did, well, I might speed. <laughs> As they know in um, Sabine Parish, as I was there last week talking to the good people there. But anyway, um, if I were to commit a crime here in this part of Louisiana today, how would they be, how would law enforcement be able to place me here? The pollens in the spring, especially in the spring, say the months of March, April, are going to be embedded in my clothing 
And there's no getting around that. They're microscopic. I know they don't feel like it sometimes. But there's no getting around it. That is forensic science. So the 56 pollens that are present on this linen tell us exactly where it has been. And I can tell you where it's been. Okay? I'm going to show you that. I'm going to come back to this in a second. It has been in Jerusalem. And this, this timeline is my own. I can't tell you what year it was in Jerusalem or what year it was in Antioch, but I can tell you that it was. It was in Jerusalem, it was in Antioch, it was in a place called Edessa or in and around Edessa in Turkey for some point of its, of its history. It was at the Dead Sea, uh, the Straits going into the Black Sea. There are pollens here that place it in Constantinople, Istanbul today. And of course, there are pollens on it from Western Europe, which are to be expected given its history in Italy and France. I can't tell you when it was in these places. I put this timeline together because, interestingly, it aligns with a historical record that an early church father tells us that there was a burial, that not the burial in it, but he calls it an image of our Lord at full length that was taken from Jerusalem to Antioch, he says, when that city fell, meaning Jerusalem in the year 70. So I can, it, the, the pollen lines up with what we know historically about a burial linen appearing in the record. All that to say, you can't, this is not something we can dismiss. This would get somebody convicted in the court of law. Okay, the most prominent pollen on here is this one you're looking at, Gondelia tornaforti, which is a blooming thorn. It blooms in March or April. It's native to the Middle East. It's not particularly, um, it's not, it's not particularly specific to, to Jerusalem or Judea. It blooms throughout the Mediterranean. But it is a blooming thorn, and it's about the size of a soccer ball. It's a huge bloom. And when, after it blooms in early spring, the bloom dries up, but what, is, what remains behind is a ball of thorns that's about that size. And the thorns are two and a half to three inches long, and they're about a quarter of an inch thick. And this is the pollen that's found on the shroud and on that sudarium in Oviedo. It's the exact same pollen. Okay, the soil I mentioned, we now know it's a very specific type of limestone. It's called travertine aragonite. And about 20 years ago, there was an effort to isolate it uh, because they knew that it was, it was a, a Middle Eastern limestone, but they didn't know exactly where it was. So taking microscopic samples all over really the area, and of course starting with the most likely place, uh, the closest match um, signature-wise under microscopic examination uh, is at the old city of Jerusalem. And as a matter of fact, the closest match is at the Damascus Gate today. So yes, dirt moves across 2,000 years, of course, but this is not a limestone that you find in Western Europe. This is not a limestone that's found in France or Italy or even in the Anatolian Peninsula of Turkey. This is a limestone that's found in the area of Judea. Okay, so here's the little sticky widget. Don't y'all love that photograph? <laughs> this is the press conference where the University of Oxford, the University of Zurich, and the University of Arizona in the United States came together to announce their results from the carbon-14 dating. Very good science. This is where you actually, you, you have to destroy, you destroy the organic matter by burning and then you have a measurement of the burn time and you can come up with a date. That's the most simple explanation that I have for it. Very good science. And they say that the shroud can be no older than the year 1260, probably more toward 1390, 14th century. Give plus or minus probably 50, 50, 60 years on either side. Okay, is there anything about this picture that bothers anybody? The guy on the left, he's the Oxford guy. <laughs> Anything else? <clears throat> Look at the blackboard. Do y'all know 1260 to 1390 exclamation point? I might ask my brother, the scientist, is that some kind of scientific notation I don't know about? Why do you feel the need to punctuate this? <laughs> Science is supposed to be objective. Just tell us the date. Right? Okay, so here's the story of the carbon-14 dating real quickly. I mentioned to you Dr. Ray Rogers, who was at the Nash, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. He, did, he just this week came out. 
He said, there's just so much we know now about the pollens, the blood, the, 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 nothing, this is not adding up. How can this have a medieval day? And he's the one who postulated that there was something chemically different about the area of the cloth that they tested. Then, in 2019, there was a young Christian lawyer by the name of Tristan Casabianca, young uh, Christian, he was Christian, but um, he's French, a French lawyer by the name of Tristan Casabianca. I was with Turin, I was with him in Turin this past July, and uh, got to know him a little better, he's a delightful young man, but he was an atheist, he was raised in an atheist home, and he went to a presentation on the shroud anyway, that's his story, but, but he was so interested in the shroud that he called up the British Museum on the phone, because they're the custodians of all the raw data from the 1988 testing, called them up on the phone and said, hey, I'd like to see all the raw data from the test. I want to see the protocol. I want to see how they did this. And he was told no. He was told no. And he said, well, this, was, this is science. This was a public test. You know, if it's not under some kind of, like, intellectual ownership, I have a right to see it. So he sued the British Museum. Sued them under the International Freedom of Information Act, forced them to release the information, and this is what he learned from looking at the raw data. The scientists violated their own protocol. Instead of taking six samples from across the linen, which is what they were supposed to do, six different areas of the cloth were supposed to be tested, each laboratory would get two samples. Instead of that, they took one sample and they cut it into six pieces. Now look, I was a humanities major and I know this, that taking one piece of linen and cutting it into six is not the same thing as taking six samples. Test question. Where was the sample taken from? Exactly. So, this is why there is more interest in the shroud again now than there has been in many, many years, is because we now know that that date is wrong. And here's the worst part of all of it. University of Arizona never even tested their samples. They still have them in a vault. And Turin, the archbishop there, uh, acting on papal authority, acting on the authority of the Pope, has demanded those samples back, and they refuse to return them. So much for objective science, right? Okay, so I'm going to get to this um, so I can conclude. The image formation process is the thing that, that troubles us the most because we can't seem to answer the question. There's 17 separate image characteristics that have to be matched if you're going to say, for instance, I've, I've heard this, um, and you can go read about this online if you're interested. There's, there's been an experiment done with eczema lasers uh, that comes close. It matches about seven of the 17 image characteristics. Uh, nuclear explosions you can match a few of these. You can't go home and make one in your microwave, okay? I, I've had people say that. Oh, I could make that in my microwave. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> We know, it's all theoretical physics, but we know the energy it took to create this based on these 17 image characteristics that have to be matched. This is what Dr. John Jackson has worked on the entirety of his life as a nuclear physicist. And it is theoretical. And do you know what I mean when I say theoretical physics? Lee? <laughs> if, it's, if it's theoretical and it's not practical physics, like we can compute it, but you can't do it. You can't do it because it's not in our physical capacity to do it. So this is 784 trillion watts of light. 784 trillion watts of light is what Dr. Jackson has computed would be required concentrated in a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth in an immeasurable millisecond. He has it down to the point, uh, I think 100 zeros and then a two or something seconds. We cannot harness that amount of energy in any laboratory in the world today. 
because in case you don't have a frame of reference, 784 trillion watts will power Manhattan Island for a year. In an immeasurable millisecond, and this is what Dr. Jackson's hypothesis is. And again, this can't be demonstrated. I hope you understand why. Can't be demonstrated, but this is what he says. What he says, I'm gonna to offer to you his hypothesis, and I have great respect for him, even though, as I said, when he explained it to me, I said, okay, I'm six. Explain it to me like I'm six. So, he says this had to have happened, that the body that was wrapped in this shroud became a spectrum of pure light, and it was 784 trillion watts of energy. Enough that would make the human form essentially materially transparent. That the body would have all the shape of a man, but none of the mass. So that the cloth collapsed right along the plane of gravity straight through the body. Which explains the frontal image and the dorsal image being right there together explains all 17 image characteristics. It's the only hypothesis that does. And why can we not recreate this? Because we can't do it. Because we can't do it. That is a hypothesis. It cannot be tested, and it will never be able to be tested. So we're really only left with two conclusions. And I've talked to groups all over the world, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I've done this for many years all over the world. And I had been in all groups of people, and I had heard all kinds of questions. But there's only two things you can walk away with about this cloth. There's only two. It's not like this is a long multiple choice question. <laughs> it is either the authentic burial linen of Christ, and that this is a, a physical remain of a metaphysical event, a natural remain of a supernatural event, it's either that, because it was created in a process that we cannot reproduce in the 21st century. It's either that, or the only other thing it can be, is it is an ancient or medieval artwork. And it is an artwork that was created by an unknown artist who had advanced knowledge of botany and blood spatter forensics and negative photography 700 years before it was invented, who never did another artwork of any kind in a process we can't reproduce in the 21st century. You don't have a lot of other options. It's one of those two things. It's one of those two things. And I'm not gonna, I usually end by not suggesting where I stand on this. Can it be a natural remain of a natural event? Could it be some natural process? There are people who think that. But we don't have anything else in the world like this. Nothing like this. No shroud like this. So, those are the two possibilities. And, uh, and this is where I always say that no matter how much scientific endeavor man undertakes, no matter how much knowledge man gleans, we always are going to be confronted with something that is greater than ourselves, something, some question we cannot answer. And when we get there, when we get to that question, what made this? Then you have to say to yourself, I am already in the presence of something greater than myself because I don't know. Because I don't know. And there's no measure of science that can take us into a supernatural realm. Science is a natural measure. Am I right, my dear brother? It is, a, it is a natural measure. It cannot measure the supernatural and never will. So that's where we are. There's lots more work going on around the world with this cloth today. It is better cared for than anything I know of in the world. I saw that firsthand. I will tell you this. I had to ask the question. It's in a very special um, encased in, in a very special reliquary today because I mentioned it was in a fire in 1997. So they put it in a new reliquary. NASA designed the reliquary. <laughs> so do you know what I mean? We can shoot the shroud into outer space and it can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and not burn up. <laughs> because that's what those people believe it is. 
So thank you very much for having me. shown in 2025. So when I was there in July, um, the, the group of men who take care of this, really only four men who, who take care of this walk literally every day of their lives, they notice, they measure it every every month. They have a um, sort of an analyzer that runs over every square thread of this and measures it for any kind of change or any kind of slippage in the fibers. And what they've noticed is there's like a millimeter of slippage because the cloth has been hanging vertically. So they moved it to laying it flat. And it'll never be hung vertically again. But what they've noticed now is that the image is beginning to fade, and they think it's because of its exposure, a continual exposure to light. So they want to limit the exposure to light. Again, they've had consultants come in and say what kind of spectrum of light they needed to use. So what they're talking about now is for 2025, not, hang, not having a public exhibition where it would be hung or displayed for a month, one solid month, but that they would make it available every week of the year for a certain number of hours so that they could limit over time the exposure it would have to this, to this spectrum of light. So look for that. It may be that it's gonna be the entire year and you could schedule it at a, whatever week you wanted to be there okay. to see it. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned the fire in the 90s. What happened Did you said it was intentional? It was intentional. Um, someone set fire to, it was actually in the, the uh, today it's not in the cathedral, uh, in, a, in the chapel it was in in the 90s. Uh, it was in a chapel adjacent to the cathedral there, and it's hung, uh, actually, it was actually in a reliquary above the altar, right the whole length of the, of the wall, <clears throat> and somebody set fire to the chapel. And I, probably in the hopes of destroying the shroud, that's, I mean, that's what we think, it's the only thing that's in there that makes that chapel particularly special. So there was an off-duty um, fireman by the name of Mario Trematore. <laughs> we call him Super Mario now. Um, Mario um, um, lived down the street from the cathedral and he saw the flames and ran down the street and um, grabbed a, a helmet and, a, and a, an ax from the back of the truck, the fire truck that was there. And, and you can see this, it's on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. And there's all these people running out because the building is, is I mean, the, the chapel is on fire and, and timbers are falling. You know what I mean? It's, it's this really dramatic scene. And he runs in. People are running out. He runs in and he takes this, uh, and it was in bulletproof glass then. And he took this axe and hit, struck the center, uh, right in the center of the, of, the, of the glass and reached in and pulled it out right at the head. <laughs> and ripped the entire length of the linen out and carried it out on his shoulder. It's on YouTube, you can watch it. So it was not damaged at all, but they, they never found out who did it, but it was deliberately said it was, it was ruled to be an arson. So, Mario has quite the story, by the way. <laughs> yes. No, we can't get a we can't get a complete um, helix. In other words, we, we don't know anything about the man's DNA at all, except that it is type A B blood and it is male. Now, will we know 20 or 30 years from now as our technologies advance? Maybe. But interestingly, it's the same situation with the Sudarian. We can't get a complete picture. There's missing information. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? I want to ask about the blood type. You said the AB, and mine is AB with the orange factor in it. Why is, it, why is the percentage so low of people with that blood It's just the rarest blood type. If you have type AB, it is the rarest blood type. It is less than 3% of the population in the world that has it. If you go down to type AB negative, if it's a negative orange factor, my son, my oldest son has AB negative. And I remember when he was tested, when he was born, the doctor went, oh my gosh, good luck with that. Because it's less than 1% of the population. So it is the rarest the blood type. Like Do you know if you're positive or negative? I'm negative. If you're negative, you are the rarest blood type in the world. 
So when Jimmy did get cut here. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have surgery either. Oh, well, I wouldn't have surgery either. Yeah. Arnold's a universal donor. You're in good shape. Well, Dave, 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 Dave. Right. Right. That's right. My father was a father. I also believe, as, I, as, as someone just commented, and I'm, this, I'm stepping a little bit out of my area of expertise, but AB. The blood type AB is a universal recipient. So receives all would be the interpretation of that. Yeah. Jameson, thank you so much for having me today and for asking me to come. Thank you.